countries. Well, um, so you uh, possibly think, uh, after having heard all of this, that I'm interested in the question of deregulation. And um, uh, so I'll just make a few comments on that, because we haven't really made up our mind about that matter. And uh, there are a number of obvious difficulties about uh, some kind of simple deregulation. Now, the first, of course, is that you couldn't just deregulate the industry. There's an important need that all would accept for quite a high degree of regulation in regard to safety questions and in regard to questions of driver competence, uh, character, language, uh, knowledge and so on. Uh, secondly, um, it's not that clear that just removing the entry restrictions would necessarily generate competition because there are other elements in the industry that can cause reduced competition. For example, if everyone has to belong to a network and there's just a couple of networks, you may not get a great increase in competition. You may just get a whole lot more people having to pay high fees to networks. Um, the networks themselves may, con may not compete very much. Uh, but as I've said, we also need to look at the prospects for getting more competition between networks and to keep a careful eye on letting new technology get to work in generating possible new forms of competition in that dimension of the market, at restrictive practices that they may engage in, and uh, so on. Um, another um, set of issues is uh, that government actions may strengthen the position of networks. As I've said, in our case, uh, there's a law that taxis must belong to a network. Um, and also, uh, under uh, our treatment of people with a disability, uh, we have something like a voucher system. In fact, people originally had a piece of paper if they were disabled, and they got half price as a result. Uh, there's a fair bit of fraud starting to occur in that dimension, so we've replaced it with a little card that you give the taxi driver. And um, it turns out that in regard to the processing of that card in the machine, the taxis all have a processing machine, obviously, uh, that there's only one system that, that is compatible with, that's the current dominant system, the cab charge system. So the government uh, has linked in its um, quite large disability support payments through one uh, system, the cab charge system. Of course, another uh, big issue is uh, the issue of what to do about people who yesterday paid half a million for a license. Um, another, and I'll come back to a couple of points on that in a minute, another issue is driver quality. That's what the public seems to be concerned about and how do we address that. And then there's the small matter of the political power of the taxi industry, or the claimed political power of the taxi industry. Well, um, now, let me um, just mention, um, while I'm passing through some of this topic, um, that there are various countries that have experimented with fairly radical changes. One of the most interesting is New Zealand. Um, New Zealand in the late 1980s decided to remove the restrictions on who could have licenses, providing they passed the normal competence and character and knowledge tests and so on. Licenses were made available to any qualified person. The cost of getting a license was negligible. The value of licenses then was $30,000. People took a bath on that. Uh, and there was no compensation. It was at a time of radical reform and change in the New Zealand economy uh, and a feeling of crisis and a need for, feeling of a need for deep reform. Of course, naturally, there was a dramatic increase in the number of taxis 
and on competition on price, companies were allowed to charge below the maximum set price. Um, an interesting point is that in New Zealand, each operator had to belong to a booking network, and there are a lot of networks at the beginning. Um, and uh, the networks are under considerable regulatory pressure to take care of driver quality. Uh, speaking in a slightly superficial way about New Zealand, uh, my impressions are uh, that it has been fairly effective in getting a very high quality of service, very, very customer responsive drivers. They want you to have a good time in the car. They're very anxious for their little business. Uh, they belong to a company, to a network, to have you back a second time. Level of customer responsiveness is very, very high and impressive. Cars are clean. Con service is really very, very good. Um, the, um, that's the reputation of these businesses at, is at stake on every ride. Uh, there are quite strong rules and sanctions imposed by the regulator for poor performance. Uh, the airports have also taken an additional role in requiring their own service standards to be met. And so you have quite a consumer-friendly industry. Um, I think also uh, that on price, uh, it is a little hard to generalise. There is some price differentiation and competition, maybe a range of about 25% in prices on offer. Um, the price level, I think, is probably on the high side. There's not been dramatic price falls. There is a degree of choice between kind of budget reasonable service taxis and higher priced, high quality service taxis, eco-friendly taxis, and things like that. There's quite a lot of competition between the networks. But I don't claim to understand the full story. Um, and, um, uh, but it does, on the face of it, look to be a very interesting experiment. In our part of the world, another very impressive industry is Singapore. Uh, Singapore began by deregulating prices and then, a bit later, it opened up entry uh, while requiring quite tight tests of driver competence and so on, and there continues to be quite a high degree of regulation, but open entry. Um, now, uh, there is a question here about um, whether there's some kind of agreement around the world about the way in which the industry is heading. And my own impression is that in, uh, the, in North America, well, at least in the United States, I don't detect um, you know, an upsurge of support at state level for having an open entry industry. Of course, at the national level, it's quite clear the Federal Trade Commission and those sorts of people are strongly in favor of open markets. I do not particularly detect it at state level in the US. In Europe, I see the picture is much more mixed uh, and in terms of the public debate, much more interest in having open entry markets with a high degree of regulation. Uh, that is what the debate is around, open market with appropriate um, regulation. Uh, we have to look around the world at best practice to see what sort of consensus if there are or is each market so different that it's not possible to generalise. But the issue of driver quality remains absolutely central in international debates. The idea that you open up a market and just let anyone be a driver is absolutely dead. Any radical reform in the industry must address the driver quality and safety issues first and probably foremost. Then there are further questions about open entry and so on. Now, um, the, um, so if you look at the OEC debates, after all, the OECD consists of 
United States, Canada, most of Europe, Japan, Korea, Australia, a few others. Um, you would find in most of the OECD uh, publications where governments come together, there's a broad consensus that we should be moving to open entry, but with strong driver regulation and then a pretty open debate about whether you would deregulate prices. You would certainly, I think it's universally accepted, you would let people charge below the maximum price, whether you would have a ceiling, uh, and when you would do it, at what stage, is a bit of an open question. So coming back to our own inquiry, um, the big issues. Well, we start with this problem of the low customer satisfaction, um, which is mainly directed towards drivers, and some say we need better training, certainly, and there have been some really interesting presentations here on that and much to learn about training. Um, the question of driver payments and conditions is very important. Would better drivers stay in the industry if there were higher rates of pay and better conditions? Is it possible to improve their remuneration? What reforms are needed to bring it about? It is often said in Australia, if you just ever watched television debates on it, that uh, when a customer pays a taxi, there are many hands in the till. The customer pays, but they're paying the license owner uh, who wants a return on the half million, maybe the broker who has assigned the license, the person to whom the license is assigned, called the operator, then the operator employs drivers, there are payments to the networks, there may be payments to cab charge or card holders, and there are a number of other payments in the system. Many hands in the till. And uh, the driver tends to be at the bottom of the pile. To use the well-known North American expression, the driver is the low man on a totem pole and tends to get squeezed uh, quite sharply. You could say that people have a fixed amount of money they'll pay for taxis and uh, someone gets squeezed, it's the driver. Uh, so should driver uh, remuneration be linked with wider sets of reforms? And of course, uh, although I have talked this morning about competition, that's my background, there's a very big range of regulatory issues, whether the industry is over-regulated in some respects, under-regulated in Others, um, what do we do about licence values? 80% uh, of our licences, I believe, are held by people who don't have any day-to-day -day interaction with service delivery. This is quite hard to explain to the public, the justification for that. Um, what's the relationship between the rise in medallion values and what's happening in financial markets. Uh, if investments in some financial markets are not so good these days, do the investors see medallions as a better investment to get into? Does that push up medallion prices? Do medallion prices get put into prices? In one way or another, they often are. Um, in our case, uh, assignments are put into cost of an assignment is put into our fares, and that's circular, because it goes into fares, fares go up, that puts up the value of a medallion, then that adds to the costs and to the return that's being sought by people in the industry, it puts up prices. There's an obvious issue there. Um, and um, one has to look at that rather important interaction. Uh, there are questions of compensation that come up um, under Australian law. We don't. We have at our national level a requirement.